So my name is Max Hope, I'm from the University of Hull and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here to Newcastle for this ESRC seminar series event um, under the name of uh, Thinking the Yet to be Thought. Now this is a joint seminar series uh, that is kind of uh, fronted by the University of Hull, which is myself and uh, Professor Kathleen Montgomery, who, who you'll hear from in a minute. But we also work with a number of other um, partners who we're really grateful uh, to work with, including, and I don't want to miss anybody out here, but we've got Michael Fielding here, Diane Ray, Will Curtis, Rachel Brooks. We have um, some other partners who aren't here, Paul Warwick from University of Plymouth, Helen Lees from York St. John. Have I missed anyone? No, I don't think so. Um, and bet between us, we organise these events and we hope to bring you kind of interesting speakers and workshops and interesting discussions. But one of the things that we really, really hope to do is bring you lot together because this is an opportunity for you to kind of network and meet other people who are interested in similar things. And we hope that from these events, bigger stuff will grow so that we will start working together, researching together, writing together and making a bit of noise about stuff to do with uh, freedom to learn. So my job is to give you a bit of the uh, practicalities of today and to, uh, I'm, I guess I'm the warm up act before we have our main event in a couple of minutes. Um, I will just say thank you Wimbledon for these wonderful um, uh, decorations. Um, we won't forget these in a hurry, will we? Um, I was told they were tasteful, but I'll leave that to you to, to judge whether they are. But that's why we've got these, these events. But uh, this is the core in Newcastle, and this, this venue was introduced to us by Liz Todd from University of Newcastle, who we are also very grateful to because we wouldn't have really known about this or known how to book it, and I think it will be a, a, a good venue for us. I hope that you found everything that you need as far as food and refreshments and toilets. I need to warn you that there is a fire alarm at 4.30 right in the middle of Professor Michael Apple's session. It will last for 10 seconds, and I'm instructed that we must all just ignore it. Now, how easy it is to ignore a 10 second fire alarm, I don't know, but we're going to try. So at 4.30, that alarm will go. If you hear any other alarm at any other point, we do have to leave the building because that will be a real one. Um, so check your watches when you hear the fire alarm. And if it's not 4.30, head for the, uh, the main exit and assemble outside. So, very briefly, I'll tell you what we're doing today. <clears throat> Using my clicker. We're starting with uh, our keynote session, Dr. Wayne Now from University of Washington, who I'm going to leave the introductions of Wayne to Catherine Montgomery, who's going to uh, uh, talk about Wayne and how lucky we are to have him in a minute. But that, he's going to start us off. Um, the session will last until 2.30ish, there will be time for you to ask questions and to interact, and we really want this to be a very much conversational and kind of dialogic event. So feel free to kind of uh, work out what you want to say to Wayne or, or, or ask questions or, or, or discuss with him. We then have um, four different workshops. Now, some of you have said in advance which workshop you'd like to go to, and that's absolutely fine. You can go to that workshop. Some of you haven't. Um, and so, for those of you who haven't, we would uh, invite you to go to whichever one takes your fancy. And this is your chance, workshop leaders, to sell your workshop in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> so, um, they've had no warning of this either. So, is Rachel Brooks willing to sell her workshop so that people will choose that workshop? Rachel, if you'd like to just stand up and tell us something about why, why they should come see you. Okay, it's a fantastic, fantastic workshop. Um, where I'm going to be talking about uh, research that I've recently completed, um, which was funded by the um, National Union of Students and the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education, looking at the role of um, student unions in contemporary higher education, have they been changing over recent years. And although there's no focus on assessment, it does tie in um, to the seminar theme by looking at power and in particular relationships between student union leaders and university leaders. So do come along, um, I'll give a presentation, but there'll be plenty of time for discussion and interaction there. Thank you very much. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Will Curtis, can you sell yourself? It's very difficult. It's actually reimagining, not re-imaging, although re-imaging does sound great. <laughs> 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 uh, we're just going to look at the um, principles and the relationships um, that underpin lots of um, traditional assessment feedback in HC and beyond. 
and then have a conversation about whether there are uh, other ways of thinking about this. Great, thank you. Professor Liz Todd. Yes, thank you, Max, for that. Yes, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you for the venue. Um, so, freedom from closing the gap. So, closing the gap in case you've been in a kind of um, vacuum or a kind of uh, cave for the last few years. Um, is the kind of mantra with which schools have got to really think about closing the gap between the rich and poor in attainment. And schools are, are instructed to be, this is the only thing they should really be paying attention to. And it has, what I'm going to be asking is, what kinds of things does this have schools and everybody working around schools doing? And are the things that it has you doing the things that you want to be doing? I'm suggesting not, that there are kind of a lot of other things that you want to be doing instead of the, the kind of narrow kind of focus on attainment and what would that look like? So what would, a, what would it be like to be free from closing the gap? What would that look like? Thank you. And if one workshop isn't enough, the fourth option is actually a double workshop where you get uh, two for the price of one. Um, and this one we're kind of billing a bit as um, early career researchers stroke students um, having an opportunity to share their work. Um, the, although the first one's a bit of a cheat because Jill Davison isn't really um, an early career researcher, but she is working alongside a student. So could you start us off, Jill and Millie, just telling us anything about your, your session? Um, um, myself, Millie, work for the Student Union at Sunderland University. And what we're going to look at is a partnership debate in relation to working with students and student unions. And we'll talk a little bit about how the, the relationship with student unions is changing over the last few years. And we'll look at some of those tensions and what, the, what, what might be the, the, the possibilities and potentials within that relationship. Thank you. And then Stephen Broughton, who is a PhD student, is sharing his work. Can you tell us anything about that, Stephen? Sure. Um, well, my research has been about evaluating uh, an assessment tool uh, that's used with math students. Um, but one of the problems with that is how do we evaluate an assessment? So in this session, I'll propose a model for an effective assessment and what that means. And we'll discuss, um, if we could start again, what would assessment look like if it was to be effective? Great, thank you. So those four workshops, they're all upstairs. Um, just at the end of here, you go upstairs, and they're all clearly marked on the door about which is which. So when it gets to 2.30 and there's a mad rush for the workshops, just kind of run upstairs, find the room that you want, and head in there, and I'm sure they'll all be excellent. Thank you to the workshop facilitators for doing that. A little bit more from me. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have come here because you know the name Michael Apple very well. Um, we are so happy that we've got Michael Apple with us today sat at the back and hopefully uh, around for people to chat to in breaks etc. Um, Professor Michael Fielding will introduce him later so I will save all the good stories to Michael Fielding to share with us. That's at four o'clock. Publicity and promotion, we do have a website, we do have a Facebook page, please do um, visit those and share them with other people. Um, and then I'm quite new to Twitter but I'm really, really trying here because we've got a hashtag F2, F2L, okay, right? And in a minute, I'm going to give you something you can tweet about. So anybody who wants to get out their phones or iPad and you're into Twitter, you're going to have an opportunity. Um, and if we can start using that hashtag for today and beyond, that would be really good. Um, we also have badges. You should have been given a badge when you pick, came in or pick one up. Have one for yourself, but also if you want to take some away and give them to students or school teachers or anybody else, just take them because we, we want to, uh, to get them out there. Okay, so you're ready to start tweeting. It's going to be happening any minute now. So the tweeting is about this. So our next event, this is the first time we've announced the date. It's Thursday the 8th of October and it's in Edinburgh. So if somebody can start tweeting about that, I'll be very happy. Um, we have... Two keynote speakers already confirmed, Professor Terry Wigley and uh, Dr. Velda McCune. Um, they will be kind of speaking on the topics of um, reimagining, not reimaging, reimagining education, seeking autonomy in school and university structures. So they're going to both talk in different ways about how schools should be structured and organised in order to uh, offer more freedom and autonomy um, and how universities should be. We will also be having a, a kind of panel event where we'll have lots of people are, are, are sort of answering audience questions and getting involved. So if you can tweet about that and also tell people about it, book it in your own diaries, turn up yourselves and if we can get as many people there as possible that would be great. 
Okay, so I think that's probably enough from me. I'll hand over to Catherine Montgomery, who will do a introduction for Wayne. Right, well, um, it's incredibly good to see everybody here, um, and um, it's particularly good to have, um, to have Dr. Wayne Au here from the University of Washington. Um, Wayne is an associate professor at, um, at the University of Washington, and his research focuses on educational equity, high stakes testing, and social justice. His most recent book, um, which has just come out in April 2015, um, is called Mapping Corporate Educational Reform, and it's about new governance in educational policy. His, I think to, it's fair to say his most famous or most well-known book, is, um, which you may, I'm sure you'll have heard of, is um, Unequal by Design, which came out in 2009, which was really influential on my thinking in terms of assessment and um, uh, one of Wayne's articles um, which looked at a Bernsteinian analysis of high stakes testing was very influential on Max and I when we were, dis when we were applying for the ESRC seminar series and actually the, um, the uh, thinking the yet to be thought, although that's Bernstein, we did see that in Wayne's article and so that was incredibly um, important for us. Um, Wayne's not just an academic, but he really values being a public intellectual. And um, one of the things that happened when Max and I were looking at Wayne's profile is we watched his, him, him being interviewed on American TV, which was great. Um, and one of the things that really struck me about that is um, Wayne's focus on the combination of ethnic diversity, um, high stakes testing and social inequality and that is really where this project's coming from and, and, and so we knew that he was the person we wanted to get to come here for this seminar um, so we're really really fortunate to have Wayne here and great that he's in England his first visit to England which is amazing um, and first visit to Newcastle so um, well, I'm really looking forward to, to, to hearing Wayne's contribution. I think it's going to be really critical to our thinking for the rest of the day. So, Wayne out. so much for uh, having, having me out here. Uh, uh, like Catherine said, my first trip to England, and um, thankfully I got 10 hours of sleep last night, so my jet lag feels behind me. It was a terrible evening yesterday evening in terms of that recovery. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just so nice to be able to be here and sort of talk about, talk about this work. Um, and, and just a little more in terms of my own personal biography. Um, I was a public high school teacher uh, in Seattle. I used to teach at school for uh, dropouts. And uh, we, uh, it was a very, very sort of radical space. We, we had 100 students and four teachers. And, um, you know, if, uh, for our US history textbook, for instance, we would just teach, straight up just teach uh, Howard Zinn's and People's History of the United States for, for US history. So we definitely had this sort of um, uh, angle on teaching that was about sort of critical consciousness and, and getting students to sort of understand their, their uh, uh, sort of how they fit in sort of the social, social cultural, institutional structures um, um, in, in the US. Uh, and then I also taught at Berkeley High School in Berkeley, California uh, for a number of years, which is like, you may or may not have read about Berkeley. It's a highly researched, uh, uh, it's, in terms of high schools, it's probably one of the most researched high schools. Uh, any, lots of Pedro Noguero's work came out of there. A bunch of places, a bunch of professors have focused on it. Um, and, uh, and so, and it was Berkeley, so, you know, it has this whole vibe, this sort of radical vibe, this sort of leftover hippie vibe from, from back in the day, right? Um, and so they have ethnic studies was a graduation requirement. There. And then I went to go work with, with, uh, with Michael um, in, in Madison uh, once upon a time. And, uh, and so I've just been sort of carrying this work forward. But I, but I really do take, um, I've been trying, you know, a lot, a lot of us in the academy, and I think of, of sort of my generation uh, in the States, at least I've seen, I have a lot of friends, we've been trying to work through our identities of folks who've seen themselves as, as sort of education activists, even before they went to get their degrees. And then how do you, how do you sort of 
negotiate that as, as, a, as a professor, right? Um, and so I still try to embody that and, and, and take very public stands on things and make sure that I'm sort of wielding my PhD, uh, uh, you know, sort of that authority on behalf of community struggles that are happening locally in the Seattle area in particular. So the video you saw was, was uh, Amy Goodman interviewing me and my good friend, close friend, Jesse Hagopian, who's one of the test resistors in the United States. Uh, he's, he's a teacher who's been resisting some tests there. And, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's just that, that kind of work is the work that I really value. Of course, that does no good for me in terms of my merit review or tenure or any of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we have to keep, continue to push my university uh, on these things. Anyways, today I'm going to be talking about, uh, uh, how, you know, how do we think about high stakes testing both historically, how it fits within this policy structure. Um, there's this whole discourse. So there's this whole discourse of, of in the United States in particular, but, it, but it clearly it's here too, like listening to Liz just even describe her workshop, right? There's this idea that, that, uh, that stand, high stakes standardized testing can lead to equity. It's a tool of equity. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking about that a little bit. Uh, the, the, one, of the, uh, one, one of the best things about coming here to do this talk was it gave me, like it forced me to have to go do a little bit of research on, on the United Kingdom, right, and, and sort of under, get a little bit of understanding of the comparative, the, little, just a brief comparative history of what's going on, so I'm going to address that. And look at some of the empirical stuff on how, like, what, what is testing doing to the curriculum and, and instruction. And then one of the concepts is two things I'm going to bring up today, to, uh, some frames to think about this stuff um, that I've been using and have been working through and trying to produce some work on. One is called neoliberal multiculturalism, and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then even more recently, I've been thinking about like trying to put together what we might think about is sort of the geo, the, like a, a geopolitical assessment of, of, of standardized testing. Um, and I'm going to talk about some alter, quote unquote alternative assessments and relative to that, and then, then what kind of organizing, give a, hopefully a brief overview of the kind of organizing that's happening amongst teachers and communities in the US as we think about alternatives and how to sort of push back um, against what's, what's going on. So, and hope, we're going to try and squeeze it into an hour so we can leave some time at the end. Um, for uh, questions and discussions. So this is just review, I'm sure, for everyone in the room. But the, when, I, when I summarize neoliberalism, I, I draw on David Harvey's work, who I like very much. Um, uh, Harvey says, neoliberalism, neoliberalism is a theory of political uh, economic practices proposing that human well-being can be best advanced by the maximiz maximization of entrepreneurial freedoms within an institutional framework characterized by private property rights, individual liberty, unencumbered markets, and free trade. <laughs> And this is a nice, just a nice little, little, little graphic. Um, other, other aspects of neoliberalism that we see is sort of a, a divestment in the public sector, okay? Uh, and then also opening up the public sector to, to the accumulation of private, private wealth. And we see that within education in particular. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Because there's a huge market, right? And in the United States, it's one of the last, it's, it's, like, it's like the great white whale. It's one of the last huge markets that, that the, that private industry has been trying, working really hard to try and get access to. So within that context, uh, in my work, we talk about uh, talk about neoliberal corporate education reform, and sort of these are sort of the characteristics that that I, that I that I've laid out. And this is uh, I, I do this with uh, my friend and colleague uh, uh, Joe uh, Ferrari, um, uh, Ferrar, uh, and uh, in the first chapter of uh, mapping uh, corporate education reform. So uh, applying neoliberalism to education, thinking about corporate reform, uh, it's about defunding public education, and that happens often through regress regressive taxes and, and budget cuts. Uh, private accumulation of public monies via marketization. Um, deregulation of educational lab labor practices, so the strong push to attack the teachers' unions. And in fact, there's a Supreme Court decision uh, that's, that's coming up soon in the United States, uh, or at least the arguments are about to be heard about the legality of teachers' unions in the United States. So it's possible that they, they, the, the Supreme Court in the United States could rule teachers' unions to be illegal uh, in the near future. Now, I understand there's some issues here, too, right, around that same, in, that, in that same area. Um, also, oh, I should have said this beforehand. You know, I'm, I'm speaking largely out of the US context. I know things are specifically different here. Right, and the terminology we use is different. And I, I, I took my, you know, my colleagues took me out to dinner last night, and I took the time to like ask them lots of questions to try and figure out some of the similarities and differences. But please forgive any of uh, uh, any of my, um, I would say, 
I don't know. I, I'm not assuming these things apply across context exactly. They don't map exactly. But I also know that things here are pretty close to the United States. And so um, you'll just have to correct me or at least inform me and educate me on how, like, what's happening in your context as it relates to the things that I'm, uh, that I'm going to be talking about. OK, anyways. So uh, reconstruct access to public education as a market. Really, it's quasi-markets. Like, that's what you have here, too, like this, when you see parental choice around uh, in the United States as charter schools. Um, uh, we're also seeing pushes for educational vouchers, using getting vouchers for public monies to be applied to any school, private, uh, religious schools, anything, that kind of push. Um, competitive valuation of schools and, and teachers um, and, uh, um, and students uh, using high state standardized testing. Uh, reshaping the discourse of education along the lines of a business, right? We don't, you know, that, you know, now, now, I, I, actually, there's a, there's a study that should be done. I've been wanting to do this. So anyone, like, like I want to, I want to get access to 10 years of school district job categorizations and look at the shift over time. Not only, not only the addition of new positions, like now it's, now in Seattle Public Schools, where I'm at, for instance, there is a testing coordinator that's the job, a full-time job of somebody at every single major school. That job did not exist 10 years ago, right? Um, but now, but now we also have, you know, our districts. They, they, you know, we we have a superintendent, and that's stuck around. But now, you know, now we have like the CEO of curriculum, right? And it's a chief, it's a CFO, a chief financial officer who's who's dealing with the budgets. And that labeling didn't exist 10, 15 years ago as well. So there's been a real shift around the discourse, um, and that's also just in addition to everything else being shifted to like. Oh, why are we doing these reforms? Number one reason is so we can be competitive on the global mar marketplace, right? We have to beat China, is, is the language you get in the United States. Um, never mind the fact that China is trying to go, turn to more progressive uh, education re reforms and trying to move away from some of the testing. It's, this, it's, like, it's like the dog chasing the tail and it just keeps going around. And goes like, um, narrowing the purposes of education and economics, right? It's all about job training. In the United States, we have this push uh, for the Common Core curriculum is what it's being called, and and the and the, the the goal of the Common Core is is college and career readiness, right? So any you know anything that falls outside of that, like I don't know, being a good person, right? <laughs> or like maybe the arts or music, like that doesn't matter. It's college and career readiness, um, and then uh, re and a reliance on non-democratically elected bodies to determine and implement uh, education policy. So uh, we see that in a couple ways. For instance, um, there's a push for mayoral control of school districts, right? So instead of having a democratically elected school board, which is largely the case in the United States, there are major, ur major urban centers like Philadelphia, uh, for instance, or Chicago, where the mayor of the city appoints the, the public school governing body, right? And so there's a push for that, despite the fact that there's no correlation between that structure and any kind of educational improvement. Um, and then also with the rise of what we have of charter schools in the United States, and just to, just as a brief background on charters, the idea of a charter is is uh, um, uh, it's essentially a, a in, sort of an independently run school. It's often either by for-profit or non-profit organization that manages manages it. Uh, they're usually run by CMOs, right, charter management um, organizations. And uh, they usually have their own appointed boards for each charter school. And there might be a state level body that sort of loosely oversees it. But it's a deregulated system. There's no public. And the reason why I bring that up is because there's actually no public accountability within the charter school structure in the United States. And as far as I can tell, it's pretty much it's, a, it's the parallel to the academies here in, in, in the United Kingdom. All right. OK. So. Apologies in advance for the super long quotation from uh, Fabricant, Michael Fabricant and Michelle Fine. Uh, but it really, it really captures how neoliberals look at uh, uh, what they see in terms of education as a market. So from the, from the quote, in public education, we have witnessed the ascent of charter schools, virtual learning, market curricula, development, and an expansive number of firms engaged in the measurement and assessment of teachers with a host of entrepreneurs making large and small profits. More specifically, profit make, making extends from publishers capitalizing on the new standards-based testing curriculum, uh, to high-tech companies experimenting and testing their curricular interventions, to real estate operators leasing property, um, uh, to exorbitant fees, to alternative certification programs, and finally, for-profit schools. Each of these fragments, pieces of profit-making, profit are part of a new gold rush to capitalize on the $500 billion 
dollars of public assets being redistributed uh, from K neighborhood K-12 public schooling uh, to the marketplace. And that five, and to me, like the mo most recently I've heard in terms of the uh, K-12 marketplace, which they, the capitalists talk about in terms of uh, more like 700 billion if you take, take it as a whole. Um, so like I said, it's the great white whale. That's one of the last sort of like untapped oil wells for these guys or something. A uh, good example, here's uh, my good friend Bill Gates Jr., uh, my favorite philanthropic capitalist, uh, who's been pushing all sorts of stuff around education policy and infiltrating the U.S. Uh, uh, Federal Department of Education. Uh, a lot of former staffers from the Gates Foundation are very high up in terms of um, uh, like the very second in command to like, our, our Secretary of Education these days. Um, so Gates in 2009, as he was trying to push the Common Core and get the states, this new, these new national standards, um, to try to get them adopted. He says, when the tests are aligned to the common standards, the curriculum will line up as well, and that will unleash powerful market forces in the service of better teaching. For the first time, there will be a large base of customers eager to buy products that can help every kid learn and every teacher get better. So do you see the market assumption, right? If we create a market, everyone will come, and then there'll be people trying to make money, but they'll be trying to make money in the service of helping kids. Like, that's this presumption that the market works best um, uh, for everybody. And so let's see. So moving to thinking about high stakes standardized testing sort of within this framework. So what the tests do, and you all know this quite well here, you know it better than us in, in many ways, like we have, we don't have league tables in the states like, like you all have here. Um, I'm sure the folks in charge of the U.S. would love us to have league, league tables, but <laughs> maybe we'll catch up to you. Um, but what, what high stakes standardized tests do is they quantify education. Right? There's this presumption that you can take this learning and this teaching and crystallize it in a very small, sort of two-dimensional, actually really one-dimensional number right? that says this is what you learned and here, and here it is. Okay? Um, and then by doing that, you create this metric right? that allows you to compare students and compare teachers, right? and compare schools. Um, you, use this, you use that number also to, to, create, to establish what's valuable. Right? You have a high number, that's, there's lots of value there. You have a low number, there's less value. Um, and then within that context, then you can use all that to create market competition, right? And so then you can, you can use that data to, uh, to choose which school you want to send your kid to. Um, and it's supposedly the better school supposedly having higher scores. And then fundamentally, and I've been feeling this a lot in the, U in the context of the U.S. in particular, is that the test data, like all the data mining that's happening, not only just the test scores, but you know, they mine, you know, when the kids put in their names and their, and you know, all, all their background information, there's corporations like InBloom in the United States who are using that, like data mining is a huge industry, and so they're using that, they're trying to use that data without asking parents, by the way. They've been using that data um, in their own systems, but it, but it provides the, the fuel for the entire uh, corporate education reform machine, right? Because, because, it, because the data gets used to set up the marketplace and the choice mechanisms, that becomes the basis for the charter school structure, right? It becomes the basis for the academy structure, right? It, be, it becomes the basis for all of the ratings around teachers and students, and, and that's the justification for the entire effort. So, just to give some background history of, of testing in the U.S. and the historical trajectory, really, in, when, when, when standardized testing came to the U.S., it was a crude misappropriation of, of Binet's IQ testing, right? And, and Binet's IQ testing was very specific. He wanted to test young children to see if they might have had a, their mildly developed, uh, had a mild develop, uh, a mild disability, right? And, and, then just, and then to help set up educational programs from, from then on. Now, the crude Americans, of course, the American psychologists, took that and then amplified that to adults and everybody else, okay? And then in the process, they started to, um, uh, they, they, what they did is they applied the tests, they created these tests and applied them to a huge pool of army recruits in the U.S. Um, and obviously, in what always happens when we give a standardized test is that the results end up reflecting the existing racial and social order. Okay? Um, you know, go back then, it's, it's very clear. Uh, poor people were quote unquote less intelligent than rich people, and white people were more intelligent than everybody else. And even back then, they even determined that Northern Europeans were more intelligent than Southern, the darker, swarthier, you know, Mediterranean, Italian uh, Europeans. And then, um, and as well, of course, it applied to uh, the African Americans came out as, as supposedly, quote unquote, less intelligent uh, than, than everybody else. So we saw that kind of reflection of the social order within those tests. And at the time, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about the, uh, oh, I didn't put the dates up there. We're talking about like early 1900s, okay? 
And at the time, there was a, there was a huge eugenics movement in the United States, and those test scores became uh, of, of like, like justification for you know, tracking, for, for arguments for the imprisonment of certain populations, uh, uh, just because it was built into their genes that they were, you know, there was, there was like uh, laws against um, uh, you know, interbreeding amongst races, miscegenation laws, and like these kinds of, these kinds of tests became fuel for, for those kinds of laws, those, kind of, those kinds of logics. And then, um, oh, and by the way, um, uh, some of these, uh, some some of those uh, initial psychologists actually were like published in eugenic journals and, and were known known as eugenicists in, in the U.S. Okay. Um, now, uh, Terman in particular, he began to bring the tests in, into the schools through intelligence testing because now, like, you're also talking about the early 1900s, which for the U.S. is the beginning of sort of mass schooling, and so there's this huge influx of kids, and the question becomes, how do you handle that huge population? in an efficient way, right, within that kind of framework. Um, and so the testing became this way to sort of like, oh, we can test everybody, these tests are objective, supposedly, uh, they're objective, and so then we can, we can do this tracking and we can efficiently sort kids into, into whatever kind of uh, education that they, that they need to have. And then we, so, so this is where you see the rise of the schools as a factory model. Um, it sort of fit perfectly with concepts of Taylorism and scientific management within education. Okay, I still feel that within U.S. public schools, right? It's the, especially in high schools, the large comprehensive public high school, you might have 1,000, 1,500, sometimes up to 3,000 kids in one school. But the whole idea that you have a bell structure and moving kids from teacher to teacher feels very assembly line-like, with the teacher as sort of the laborer in this process. Um, and and uh, you know, at the end, they, they get their diploma, they get their stamp as inspected by number 32 or whoever. <laughs> And it all raises questions about the, the, the presumed objectivity of the tests, okay? Um, here you see the ideology of meritocracy, right? If you just work hard as an individual, that'll show up on your test score and you can make it in the country, right? You, you, you'll be successful, this, this is what we do. Um, um, of course, the ideology of meritocracy uh, you know, forgets other things and, and sort of gets used to justify inequality because if you presume it's all individual hard work, then those that are poor or not doing as well, then guess what? It gets blamed on them. Well, it's just your fault, right? And that, that feeds into all sorts of stuff around, say, cultural deficit models, right? Certain kinds of people don't do well because it's in their culture. That's what, what it gets framed as. <clears throat> so you have to ask the question of then also, you know, is it really about equity when, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we see this? Now, I don't know the trajectory of testing here in the UK, okay? And I'd be curious to see how that, how that lays out um, uh, relative to it. Um, so, when thinking about our, our policy paths, though, for the, for the United States and for the and for the um, United Kingdom, United States, uh, our our big watershed mo moment in terms of standardized testing, high stakes standardized testing, uh, really starts in 1983 with the publication of *A Nation at Risk*. Right? This was this is Ronald Reagan, Cold War, literally said, you know, if anyone had literally evoked like nuclear Armageddon in its in its rhetoric around education, that if any foreign nation had done this to our kids, we would be, we would be going to war with them, okay? Um, and so, really, after Nation at Risk, that triggers 54 state-level commissions around ed 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 educational achievement. Within three years, 26 U.S. states had raised graduation rates, uh, graduation requirements, and then at 35, it has started to institute um, test-based reforms. It's a really sharp trajectory, you can see it happen. By 1994, we had 43 states that had K-5 testing. And by 2000, uh, 49 states all had mandatory uh, high stakes standardized testing. Now, now, mind you, because of the relationship, historical relationship in the United States between state control versus federal control, these are all individual states doing testing, even though it's under sort of a federal rhetoric around the need to raise standards, right? So we, did not ha we, don't, have, we, have, we don't have national testing in the states um, yet. Uh, although the common core state standards are actually a movement to have national testing. And then we get uh, the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001, which was passed into law in 2002. And there was a federal mandate for testing there in, in, in that, and also support and a real push for charter schools um, within, within that context. So the, this is 2002 sort of No Child Left Behind just crystallizes sort of the quasi market approach to education. You, we need to report all this test score data, and we need to uh, uh, create more freedom and autonomy for charter schools and, and give parents more choice within that framework. And it's important to note that in the US, 
no child left behind, and all this testing stuff has always had bipartisan support. Right? A lot of people pin no child left behind and say that's Bush's education law. And I go, no, actually Kennedy was one of the major co-authors of that law and co-sponsors. Like if it was a bipartisan Democrat and Republican um, law in the US. And then by 2010, as part of Obama's administration, right, Democratic administration, uh, we got race to the top, right? Which was actually a competitive grant system where each state applied to the federal government and, and, and there was a rating system. And so, for instance, if, if charter schools were legal in your state, then you got this many points. And if you use tests to evaluate teachers, you got this many points. Like, I had a point system. Uh, my state of Washington did bad, did poorly on the Race to the Top grant program, even though they applied, because at the time that we applied, we didn't allow charter schools, and we, didn't, and we don't have uh, teacher evaluations uh, tied to test scores. And so we didn't get any Race to the Top money in Washington State, but other states did all that. And so, and if, you, if, you, if your state had adopted the Common Core Standards, this new national standards push, and, um, then you got more points. And, and really here, within the Common Core and the Race to the Top, you see this rise of value-added measurement, which you've been doing here for quite a while, but there's a whole quasi-pseudoscience being developed in the, in the states around, you know, uh, basically it's using statistical models to say, um, this teacher added this many test points to this individual kid. Right, um, and it's really it's, it's a junk science. It's, it's like it's if you if you look at the history of it and 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 the the problems with the with the uh, unreliability of using tests in this way, you'll see that it's actually so this manufactured thing. But policymakers love it because it makes it makes lots of good common sense, right? You should be able to teach a kid, and it'll just magically pop up on the next test. Um, okay, so you all know this, but this is just me sort of sorting through. Uh, what I saw is very parallel paths, right? The 1980 Educational Act, which focused a lot on uh, choice mechanisms here. I think you guys were ahead of us in terms of in terms of policy, um, and I mean that just, I guess, I don't, I don't mean not more progressive. You were just <laughs> further down, you were just further down the neoliberal path than we were. Um, the 88 Education Reform Act, right? When Ofsted got made and the implementation of high stakes testing became really, uh, really, really strong there. League tables, I, it still amazes me, the, the whole league table thing. Um, and then uh, it's 2003 on, we're seeing increases in tar and the ideas of targets and that kind of measurement, marketization, the rise of the academies. And, and then the other thing I thought was interesting is that a lot of this, these reforms have happened, right? Uh, just like in the US, as both Democrats and Republicans here, uh, it's had the support of both labor and conservative parties. So, you know, the US politics is so contentious, right? The, Demo and I, the Democrats are not left. I have no illusions about that. I know what a real left looks like, and the Democrats are not that in the United States. Um, but they fight all the time, like contentious, like can't get anything done, fighting, fighting, fighting. But then they all agree on education, right? And I feel, and, and that looks like it might be, I don't know, you, it might be the same here. Um, so, but you definitely see that bipart, that, that uh, cross uh, um, party support. So empirically, let's look a little, real quickly at what does testing do to, uh, uh, to classrooms and kids. And this is real, really brief, but just a quick summary of a couple things. Obviously, we see curriculum shrinkage, right, uh, to the tested subjects, right? Math and literacy are all that's tested. And so what happens? Oh, social studies, history, geography, art, music, recess, lunch, right? I mean, how far does that list go? But you start, you start to see this shrinkage to, to the test. Like, we're, if, if we have to raise test scores, so all we're going to do is teach the test, teach the test, teach the test. And I had, man, I had the most frustrating discussion with, a, with this big value-added measurement guy. And he was like, well, if it raises the test scores, who cares? Right? That was his, that was, and I was ah, it was amazing. Anyways. Um, and what's been interesting in, in Washington, Seattle, this, the recess thing has become has become a growing issue. So, so students are losing recess due to the focus on the test. What's happening though is that's actually getting some of, some more afflu white affluent parents in Seattle, in particular, uh, upset as well. They're like, wait a minute, I'm taking away recess from my kid, okay? And then it's it's actually created some space for some coalition work that I've, that I've appreciated. Uh, we've also seen an increase in teacher-centered instruction, right? More lecturing, more rote instruction, because you know the test is going to test. We have to cover this much space, this much material for the test. So I got to get to that as fast and as efficiently as possible, right? And so the only way I can do that, I can't do. You know, you, I don't have time to let you all process 
learning for yourself, I just gotta keep feeding it to you so we can get to the end point so you can, so you can do well on that test. Uh, there's a focus on bubble kids, right? And so when you have this idea of proficiency, okay, this, this cut mark, and then there, you might, so you know, and so you've got a bunch of kids who might be right below that line, and you might have a bunch of kids who are also way down here. It doesn't make any sense to focus on the kids way down here. Don't put your resources there because they're not gonna help you uh, get to the proficient mark. You wanna focus all your resources on these kids right below the line, because if you push them up, then, 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 you're gonna, then you're gonna get a bump up in your score. You might move up in the league tables, right? And, and, then, uh, and, and, so, and so don't worry about the, the lowest performing kids. Just focus on the kids who are close, all right? So we're seeing that happen um, in the States. And then uh, 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 also teachers avoid, they wanna avoid teaching at the tested grade levels, right? So like, um, you know, eighth grade is one of those highly tested levels, uh, grade levels in the United States. And so teachers will be like, okay, I don't wanna be an eighth grade teacher, I wanna teach seventh grade, right? Because then they, the pressures are less in the non-tested -tested grades. So here, again, you all know this, this was me just sort of making some connections. Uh, the research I looked at showed that there's the same kind of curriculum distortion here. Really parallel, actually. Um, a lot of easier exams are being moved to grade levels that count. This is according to the West uh, paper that, that I read. Uh, again, the same thing, the bubble kids thing, right? Uh, focus of resources, the borderline CD pupil, pupils so that, so that the league table impact can be maximized. Uh, school skimming pupils to raise test scores, okay? And we see this less, see, in, in, uh, in, the, in, you know, in the public school system in the States, uh, you can't skim in that same way because everyone just has to be there. It's all about, then it becomes about what neighborhood you live in and what school you go to relative to the neighborhood, right? Um, but charter schools in the US, you know, they, they're quasi-public and they actually find ways to keep the low-performing kids out. Right, so you see, it ha you see the same process happening with charter schools in the U.S., where um, they do crazy things. Like they might, they might give, they might make kids do a test to get into the school. They've asked, they've asked for social security cards. They've asked for medical records. Um, sometimes they'll advertise. They'll say, "Okay, we're only accepting applications on this one day," right? And so you have to be within the, the network. You know, you have to have the social capital to know when the, when the school is going to be accepting applicants. So these are quote unquote public schools, but they find ways to skim uh, students in, in the states. And then we're seeing uh, increased racial and ethnic segregation um, here relative to the tests and the skimming students. And we are seeing increased uh, segregation in the states as well. But I would say it's it's not within the context of the testing. It has as much, to me it has as much to do with the changing uh, populations, the gentrification of of, of of inner cities. Um, that, that, those kind of processes. So one thing I, I point out in the work that I do is, is I, I, I talk about how uh, testing is racialized. It, it is a racial project, okay? Um, so we have this history of, I referred to the eugenics movement before, so we have this history of racism, just endemic systemic racism in the, in the US public school system, okay? It's always been the case, all right? Um, and, and, so, and so we have to recognize when we talk about education, education reform, that schools have been about reproducing inequality in a broad, in a broad sense, okay? And one of the things that happens within activist struggles in, this, in the states is you, you do see some, a split in sort of the racial um, struggles around uh, testing in particular because of this. Because for communities of color, we know that like, for, for non-whites, we know that the public school system is guilty. I mean, you know, for native communities, the state, the state school system is, was about um, colonization and basically trying to beat the native, beat the Indian out of the native kids, right? Beat, beat the indigenous, beat, like just, just take the indigenous cultures and wipe it out. That was the attempt of the state school system, right? Um, and we know for African Americans it was segregation, totally underfunded, um, and then once, 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 once things were, uh, once segregation was officially ended, uh, it was basically uh, moving the African American kids to the white schools into, into communities that actually uh, actively uh, were racist. Uh, to them. I mean, like, so there's this history that we have to recognize, and so there's no reason to sort of assume that, that communities of color um, uh, should trust the public school system in that way. And so, so, yes, there needs to be this change, right? And so, within that framework, then the whole system, and this is sort of the good sense, um, if you want to think about it in Gramscian terms, the, the good sense of, of high stakes standardized testing is that folks get drawn in because what it does, you can say, oh, look, we have the data, and we can daylight, we can highlight the racism and the inequality. Right, that's, that's the one hook that people get drawn into around it. 
um, uh, around, around testing, particularly with communities of color, right? This is the only way we can show that the system is treating our kids poorly so we can get the resources directed, re redirected uh, in that way. And, and I'm sympathetic to that, I understand that. It's a pragmatic argument. Here's the system, here's this mechanism for us to figure out a way to get some resources, and then we're gonna, we're gonna make use of that. And so within that, it gets framed as a civil rights issue. So here's, here's a few uh, historical quotations. George Bush, education is the great civil rights issue of our time. Uh, his Secretary of Education, Rod Page, the educational achievement gap is the civil rights issue of our time. Here's our current uh, Secretary of Education, Ari Duncan, education is the civil rights movement of our generation. Here's President Barack Obama, education is the civil rights issue of our time. See, they agree, right? Uh, and, and, and here's like Condoleezza Rice, uh, 2012, education is the civil rights movement of our day, right? And there's a couple more. Michelle Obama recently said one. Condoleezza Rice also recently made another statement that was very anti-union and saying, uh, and, and, but all of it, it gets framed in the same exact way, right? And so you can see how these guys have sort of seized on the inequality and then used that fact as a way to push through uh, these particular sets of reform, these reforms around standardized testing. So I think about this, this racialization around testing and education reform as a product of neoliberal multiculturalism. And this comes from Jody Malamed's work out of actually literary theory. Um, her, her book is super interesting, especially the first few chapters. It's called Represent and Destroy. Um, anyways, neoliberal multiculturalism, quote, uh, has disguised the reality that neoliberalism remains a form of racial capitalism. Races continue to permeate capitalism's economic and social processes organizing the hyper-extraction of surplus value from racialized bodies and naturalizing a system of capital accumulation. Yet multiculturalism has portrayed neoliberal policy as the key to a post-racist world of freedom and opportunity. Right? And so you, get, you, get, you see the neoliberal impulse to like capture these discourses around, the, around equality, and if we can just marketize that, right, we're going to fix it. Okay? Despite the fact that it's actually uh, uh, making things like, like empirically worse for those four communities of color. So, so what's testing doing for children of color in the US? For one, we, failure just becomes concentrated in communities of color, right? That's just what happens with, with the tests. Because the tests have always, to continue to reflect um, uh, social economic inequalities, uh, it, it, just, it just makes, these communities just become communities of failure. That becomes a label that, get, that, gets, that gets put on them. Um, and then in terms of the, the curricular impacts, for instance, uh, low-income kids of color experience that curricular narrowing, the curriculum squeeze, at with much more intensity than, than other communities, all right? Because right, if the tests reflect like uh, economic class in particular, um, then wealthier affluent communities actually do better on the tests, so they're not as worried about uh, their performance, so they're not gonna squeeze the curriculum as much, right? But in terms of what gets, what gets uh, prescribed for kids of color, that changes uh, uh, sh sharply. And so then what we see is sort of like this whole idea of, of basically these become like testing policies become policies for other people's children, okay? Because this is one of the things like, you know, Bill Gates has been pushing testing, 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 and value-added measurement to evaluate teachers, all this stuff on U.S. public schools. And, and I keep thinking, well, but where did his kids go to school, right? Well, his, his, his firstborn went to Lakeside, uh, which is like this elite prep school in Seattle with like classes that are like 13 kids and a rich liberal arts curriculum. And these schools, they don't worry about any of these tests. They could care less about the Common Core standards. They don't care about any of these, these states. I'm like, okay, Gates, right? If you want, like, why don't, why don't we just fund education and make our schools like the schools that you will send your kid to, right? Um, but, but this is very clearly a case of like, oh, this is, we want this policy, we want this testing for those kids over there because we aren't sending our kids to, it, to, to those same schools. Um, and, then, and then that's not only just in terms of the private schools, but it's also just in terms of, um, of the affluent public schools too, the, the public schools that are in more affluent communities that aren't worrying about the tests as much. Um, and so you see this real split. You know, it's the same thing, There's all, other policies get wrapped into this too, like you think about Teach for America and the whole deregulation of teacher education. And so we're sending, those, those, those Teach for America candidates become sort of the shock troops. Uh, they, they've got five weeks of it. If you don't know about Teach for America, it's, it's all about, you know, they, they, what, they, they claim they take the best and the brightest from, from the elite uh, universities in, in the states, 
you give them five weeks of training in the summer, and then put them into high, quote unquote, high need schools, right? And so here you have folks with the least training going into the schools that need the most intense resources. Um, and so, but really, and so you see this sort of split about like, uh, um, you see this split about, about how you have these totally affluent folks just going and doing these drive-by reforms, because they're in there for two years or three years max, and then they leave again, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's, like um, uh, it's almost, it's, it's sort of, it's like, it's like Peace Corps model, right? Except for it's for public schools in the United States. And so they, they're in and they're out. Um, and so it's really, it's like, it's those schools over there, and then, then you know, for, for, for the masses, for the, for the plebeians, and then, and then you have these other schools that don't actually deal with these things in the same kind of way. And then the process, because it's, cause if it's not on the test, right, it's not going to get taught. We know that multicultural curriculum and like cultural relevant pedagogy, like things that would be about making curriculum and teaching relevant to the kids in, the, in their communities, that's not on the test, so it's not going to be in the classroom. Like that's disappearing, right? So why teach like multicultural children's literature uh, if, if that's not going to help them boost their test scores, okay? So, so I would argue that with the testing, not only this the narrowing of the curriculum, but it's also about the increased alienation of kids of color and their communities from the classrooms. The other, there's some other things that are happening too. I would say that that a testing of high stakes culture, of high stakes testing, brings this high stakes culture, which creates a sort of like space, it creates schools into places of like punishment and surveillance, okay, and threat, right? Think about that. Basically, when you have this, this mechanism that's sort of driving everything, you are working under threat, right? Because if you don't raise that test score, you're gonna get, you get, you'll get bad marks, you will, whatever. You're not gonna get into the university you wanna get into. I mean, there's this, this whole, whole framing around, around uh, punishment. And again, it's, it's, it's sharper again for kids of color. And then even more empirically, there was a 2013 study that showed that ex state exit exams um, uh, actually increase a student's rate of incarceration by 12.5%, right? And that's because the kids who fail drop out and then they get caught up in the legal system in the United States, okay? Um, and so you can see this, so not only do we get this culture of like surveillance and discipline, which, which ends, ends up being more prison-like, right? Get a, a literal movement of kids from schools to prisons uh, be, because of the, one of the impacts of uh, high stakes exit exams. And this is all, in, despite the fact that test-based policies have closed no achievement gap for the last, since, so go back to 2002, when No Child Left Behind became law in the United States. Here we are 13 years later, 13 and a half years later at this point, and if the gap between white and black students, if you want to use that metric, if you want to give value to that metric, has not closed at all. In fact, it's gotten worse, right? Um, and, and so, again, uh, one of my main arguments when I talk about U.S. education policy is that it, it's 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 rhetoric and ideology, and it's not empirical reality. Right? That's it's political football is what happens uh, with education. But all this happens under the guise of racial equality. And here's the thing: it's the same results now, essentially, that we had for 100 years. Okay. And I was looking at Dave Gilmore's paper, and he talked about uh, James Watson here, your Nobel your Nobel Prize winner. Uh, who had very racist things to make say about tests and, and Africans in particular, um, uh, and so it's, it still lives and breathes in people's in a lot of people's sort of common sense ideology that the tests are measuring something innate and biological in terms of intelligence, and then that that justifies uh, uh, whatever sort of ranking we have socially. So this, I've been, what I've been thinking through relative to all this is how do we think about a political geography of assessment? How do we think about spatial relations within this? And I'm just trying to work this out. And so giving this talk, giving the opportunity to sort of think about this a little, a little bit. Because we see that there's, like, there's power imbued in these relationships that stretch across like, space and time. All right? um, and there's extreme distances involved. So these tests are being created by, by people who are far away from our classrooms and our students and our teachers. Right? I mean, Pearson, someone at Pearson somewhere, either here lo globally or whatever, is like making this test right? or writing this textbook for the kids in, in, in our classrooms, in our local spaces. So there's an actual, literal, sort of physical distance that exists there. But there's also other forms of distance too, right? That, that spatial distance, oh, it's incorrect spelling spatial, excuse me. Uh, there's a bureaucratic distance, right? Because it's not like these policy, policy makers and politicians are in our classrooms, right? They create, there's these, we, have, we have layers of bureaucracy between us and them, and the tests get used to steer us, to, to, to essentially sort of control what's happening at the local level through, through those bureaucracies. 
There's also a cultural distance, because anytime you have standardization of knowledge, there are cultural norms that get embedded in that standardization. And so we get a, a what I would say is a cultural distance between the local cultures that, uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, in terms of our students and our communities and our teachers um, versus, versus what, what, gets, what the tests sort of uh, uh, measure. Um, and then I would say there's even a political distance in terms of the political realities of sort of what we know a policy is doing, right, at, 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 like at our classroom level versus you know, the common sense of politics that policymakers are pushing uh, um, uh, test-based um, reforms. So uh, a mentor and colleagues call this theory of distance. And there's something happening here where when you have that much distance, I think it requires like a rigidity, there's a rigidity to it, okay? And, and it, like the farther away, it feels like you have to have, it has to be more rigid, more authority, it has to be more, com more com like you have to be compelled, like you have to make up that distance somehow uh, if you want to control what's happening at the local level. And so I feel like, I feel like there's something in the tests that, 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 uh, that uh, makes things just much more sort of straightjacketed in a way in order, in order to keep that control at the local level. Um, Stephen Ball talked about this in terms of the terrors of performativity, particularly for, for teachers here. Um, and then finally, there's also a, what I would argue is, is a form of epistemological difference. Because the tests assume that this decontextualized knowledge, the standardized knowledge that's on the test, that's out of, that's out of the context of the schools and communities, the local, that that's, that's what needs to be learned. And, and, and in order, when you take a test, you're, you're looking at knowledge that's decontextualized. Because it becomes, it's, it's, it's con only context is that test, that computer screen, right? Or that piece of paper. That becomes the context of the knowledge and not the actual um, uh, knowledge that you might have created or constructed with your students in the classroom, for instance. Um, it also decontextualizes judgment because the person making the assessment is again this faraway person. So we're seeing that now um, with the Common Core testing in, in the United States. Uh, basically, uh, Pearson and some of the other folks they put out Craigslist ads. Literally, they went onto Craigslist and placed ads to hire masses of people to come come grade our the, our Common Core tests. Okay, and so here are these folks who were trained by Pearson or whatever uh, who might have who might have a bachelor's degree, hopefully at least. Who, who may or may not know anything about education, they certainly know anything about you or your students, but they're gonna read this, this thing that your student wrote and, and, and make the assessment that could actually determine their graduation or their future, or if you're a teacher, it could determine your positive valuation or negative valuation. So we have this decontextualized judgment that happens. Also, when we think about epistemology, really it's, it's the positivist assumptions that are behind the test, right? That it's an objective measure, that, 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 that this sample that you're taking from the student uh, who's taking the test, you're really taking a sample of them and, and what they know, and then you can generalize that and make some sort of objective measurement, okay? And that creates comparabilities. So in the states, at least, although, I mean, you guys have league tables for universities, right? I mean, like, like, you're, like that's, that's, like, you, I, I feel like, you, again, you guys are way ahead of us uh, in, in the states uh, in that regard. But part of it is also because, you know, higher education, the professors are a site of resistance, so they can't be. Um, and there's a whole bunch of us in the states who've been constantly just like speaking out and railing. Not enough of us, but but there's a fair there's is a fair number of folks doing kind of work. I mean, not only Apple has been doing this work for years, but there's a whole other generation of folks uh, who've, who've come up. So I mean, I see that I see the potential. I just feel it. And I'm in teacher education, where we I think we have the sharpest in teacher education in the states in higher ed, um, because now I don't know if they do this. I don't know if they do this. Maybe they do this here already, but they're talking about measuring our teacher education programs based on the value added scores that our teacher candidates produce. So it's a twice, it's a twice removed value added measurement, basically. <laughs> do they do that here? Is that, is it, is it coming? I don't know. Um, so, and so they wanna, they wanna basically make or break teacher education programs based on that kind of measurement. At the same time, they're promoting Teach for America and the deregulated forms of teacher education. Um, so we're, we're getting in sharpest, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure if they, It'll be interesting to see if they can do that, um, let alone sort of pull off league tables at, at gen, in general for the universities in the United States. Okay, well, Lee from Durham University. I was interested in what you were saying about the, um, the local assessment, and there's a lot of research on youth studies that talks about young people's experience being the interplay of local, global youth cultures, sure. um, and, and how do you see assessment kind of engaging with that and being close to it? 
Yeah, I think I think about, uh, for instance, YPAR, right? Youth Participatory Action Research, probably is the audience that <laughs> hear, hear that in, where you know you have students. And you know, assessment is partly about what we just call it, right? I mean, I think when a student does a does a YPAR project where they, they identify an issue, it's very furry in a sense. Identify an issue that's a community issue, do research around it, um, develop a plan of action, and maybe begin to implement. Like, like, and if we like, if that's our goal and everything that's embodied in that, then that's you know, and that has that interplay of, of local and global and students dealing with culture as, as a mediator between it. Like, like that's all there. And if that's what we're after in assessing, then that's beautiful. I, I would consider that to be a good assessment, right? Um, especially when you have students like calling press conferences as their final project, right? Here's this issue of environmental racism happening in my community. I'm calling on the press. We're gonna like, like what a great final exam, right? You know, and like, if you can do that, then yeah. So, so I def definitely, definitely see that. I think that's a powerful space, but. My name is Neil McKinnon. I'm not English, but I'm a primary school principal or head teacher in Scotland. And the question I want to ask, well, not a question, very brief observation, is what I'm seeing as the problem, actually, is the colonization of the discourse amongst my colleagues. Mm. As the neoliberal agenda comes in and power relations, I'm finding my own colleagues buying into this. I'm fighting back not against some of these forces, but amongst the people I'm working with yeah. who are just buying into it. And that's one of my sites of greatest resistance. And I just wonder if you have an observation on that. Um, yeah, for, for us in the States, I, I feel that very sharply in a couple ways. I mean, I feel that with my colleagues anyways. There's a lot of people I would say more strongly as professors who, do, who don't see themselves as activists, then the idea of resistance takes a different, like it scares them a little bit, I think. And, they, and they're so strongly identified with the institution that they're sometimes unwilling to speak against it, right? But in terms of my teachers, I feel that really sharply with um, you know, I teach teachers, or fu future teachers, right? These are folks coming in through teacher education, going into the ranks. And so if you go back, and this has to be true here too, um, you know, No Child Left Behind was signed into law in 2002, right? It's now 2015. So now I've, I have people who are becoming teachers who basically all they know and remember about education is testing, right? That's, so their common sense becomes, um, uh, uh, it becomes wrapped around the idea that this is what assessment looks like. It's just what it looks like. Right, and so then it it, it 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 really shapes the kinds of conversations we have and and the space like like I think it makes it very difficult to have some of these conversations because particularly for um, uh, folks who don't necessarily have a critical consciousness or political consciousness who become teachers they just think this is the way it is and we start to push back on that it messes them up now there are other things contributing to that too because a lot you know te those who become teachers it's a sifting process the higher up you go into the education system right. Um, the more it just it shucks off folks who don't fit in. And so by the time you get here, we have a lot of good test takers who become teachers. And so if I go, oh, the tests are invalid, they're like, wait a minute, I did great on my SATs. What are you saying? I'm not smart, right? And there's, there's also, so there's a cultural reproduction mechanism that, that gets built in uh, for teacher education, I think, that contributes, contributes to that, that piece as well. Um, a lot of, I just think it's, also, you know, think about in the United States, right? Like our consciousness about unions and, the whole, and labor relations is just backwards. And really, you know, the unions start to be crushed. Really, um, you know, you go back to the '80s. Like we just have this, we just have this consciousness uh, in, around like all these kinds of things. Like push, the idea of pushing back doesn't even seem like within their framework um, uh, sometimes. So, so there's a lot of factors I think that contribute to that 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 kind of thing for sure. We're just going to take one more question from the back. It's been really, I tell you, really, not, not really, it's been really valuable listening to you because it's obvious that England and the USA are leapfrogging each other and have been for, for, for some years. The differences are sort of quite, quite subtle. Uh, I think in testing, in use of IQ tests in, back in the 1920s, it was never racialized here. It was always about sifting in, in class terms, yeah, class terms yeah. and, and, and enacting a sort of symbolic violence on working class communities by the pretense that they weren't getting through to a higher levels of education because they were just stupid, or most of them were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, the, the big focus recently has been the pretense, you talked about neoliberal uh, multiculturalism, well we have neoliberal claims to social justice pretending that all this is to help the poorest most disadvantaged were in fact it is symbolic violence 
uh, enacted on teachers to pretend that they are the problem, and yes. mm -hmm. rather than and to de deflect from the big reason for overachievement, which is poverty. Yeah, and that's ex that's so exactly the same as in the states. I mean, in this, you know, despite every piece of research will say, oh, if you take a test score, you can only attribute maybe 10 to 20 percent of that test score to the teacher if you want to use that metric and, and justify that. And everything else is either other school factors and then like 65% of it or more is like non-school factors, right? So here, and so it becomes this thing to say, okay, we're not going to deal with poverty or any have a, have a real social program, but we're going to focus on teachers and, and work on sort of uh, marketizing. I, just that, you know, I just too bad I had, I ran out of time in terms of rushing towards the good stuff at the end because I don't want us to feel like, oh, it's such a bummer. But like, you know, the opt-out movement has people, has the folks in the state so freaked out in terms of the powers that be that they, the conversations around the renewal of our federal education bill have actually talked about pulling the stakes off of the tests entirely. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the reality when it gets done, but the fact that the politicians have had to even entertain the possibility of taking this high stakes off of the tests means that there's, there's, a, there's enough of a cultural movement going on around this issue that they feel fearful um, that that policy is going to help, help get, make them lose too much ground um, in terms of their political power. And so, and so I do see that as a, as a victory. It's a symbolic victory. Um, and there's, there's a bazillion other things I'd rather do, like in terms of fixing public education in, um, in general. But just the fact that this movement has gotten strong enough there, that, that, that you know, it's got the powers that be like having to think about um, what, what they're doing in a way that they haven't had to really up to this point. So. Yeah, Wayne, thank you very much for that incredible, um, incredibly powerful speech. And we can see that there is hope and there's, um, there's, there's a movement against them and freedom to learn is, is hopefully part of that. And um, we'll, we'll keep on with our links with you and, um, and keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.